All right, well, good evening. Hey, Chuck Lee Master with Team Faith. Always a pleasure to be with you guys, and we'll go ahead and get started in the interest of time. And I know, it's a, I was telling the Michael back there that, you know, we're non-denominational here, but I almost think we're Baptists. You know, we all show up right on time, a few minutes late, fill from the back to the front. It's all good, though. So, pleasure to do church at the racetrack with you guys. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord, thank you so much for today. Just thank you for your blessing. I know it's it's cold, it's misty, it's rainy, and then it's sunshiny, but we get to race four-wheelers, dirt bikes. We get to do what you put in our heart to do, and we want to do it to the best of our ability, but we want to give it up to you for your glory. And would you just meet us here right now, speak to us, open our hearts, draw us closer to you, and use us for your eternal kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. So, um, I know I've mentioned it before, you know, back Back in the day, uh, after high school, I actually went to college for a little bit. Said, "Man, that's not for me." So I joined the army. And when I joined the army, I, uh, I insisted that I go infantry because I wanted to crawl through the mud. I'm in, a, I'm in the right spot for that. I wanted to crawl through the mud, shoot guns, throw hand grenades. And uh, they tried to talk me out of it. Said, "No, no, no." I said, "No, I, I, I guessed C on all my test answers. So you know, I'm not really as smart as you think I am. I want to be infantry." They let me be infantry. And uh, so I did, I got to run, crawl through the mud, shoot guns, throw hand grenades. And a big part of it was doing land navigation uh, with a map and a compass. Now, surprisingly, I was actually pretty good at it. And I say surprisingly because you dropped me off on top of Snowshoe Mountain, I have no idea which way is north. I thought it was that way, but you pull the compass out. It's like, oh no, it's that way. And, uh, you, but you give me the map and a compass and I'll figure it out. I, I was actually pretty good at getting where I was going. And so um, this right here is my topographical map of my hometown there in Sail Creek. And uh, I know it's not much to look at, but hey, where I live, I'm down in the lower, I guess it'd be the lower right corner for where you are, that's Sail Creek down there. There's the hill that I hunt deer on. And up here's the Cumberland Trail. And over here, this is where we go dirt biking. So I got it all on a map right here. And uh, if you, if you weren't those back row Baptist guys, you'd be able to see that on this map, there are grids. There's latitude, longitude lines. They're going, longitude going down this way, latitude going this way. You got these grid lines on here. Now this is a civilian map and you can go to mytopo.com. You can get a map for anywhere in the world, sent right to your house, however you want it. And uh, I ordered the civilian latitude, longitude because uh, military grid, I didn't figure I was gonna be calling in artillery anytime soon. So, uh, you know, if I need, Latitude, longitude, of course your phone will give that to you, but if you're out of service and you're up there in the Cumberland Trail, you got the map right here, and you got the compass, and this is a military style compass that uh, uh, you can buy for 80, 90 bucks on, on Amazon, whatever, and it'll tell you which way is north. It's also got these little numbers in here, and if you want to shoot an azimuth, that's where you read the map, you say, oh, I want to go, I want to go uh, north at 180 degrees or whatever that is and you you figure it out right here and, and you start mapping your way you start hiking your way across the land i thought i was really good at it in the army until i went out for my expert infantry badge and uh, i got through all the hard stuff people were complaining about the shooting was too hard no i was qualified expert on that the hand grenades man you gotta watch that no I, I qualified expert on hand grenades got out to the land nav with the map and the compass i'm like yes home free they said all right go to this grid coordinate using my map and compass i go to the grid coordinate and they say tell me what numbers on the paper plate out there something to that effect i get out there and it was it was like three thousand meters away so three clicks away i get out there and when i get out there there's the plate with the number 20 yards over here is a plate with a number 20 yards over here is a plate with a number you'd be like oh man if i was off by just a little which one of these is it but I was confident. I knew that I knew that I knew that I had done it right. And I rechecked my map. I rechecked everything, wrote the number down on my piece of paper. I rucked it back, got in had plenty of time, turned in my paper, turned in my sheet. Sergeant looks at it, no go. I was like, what? What do you mean it's no go? The number was 23. He's like, it was, you wrote 32. Yeah. <laughs> I've never been dyslexic a day in my life. And I inverse the numbers over there and I failed my expert infantry badge because it was stupid. Just wrote the wrong number in the wrong place. But other than that, give me a map and a compass. I'm good to go. When you get your map, one of the first things that you have to do, it's really cool to look at all the pretty colors, look at all the lines in here, see where your house is and all that. But if you want to use this for navigation, 
the most important part of the map is this page right here. You get down to the lower right hand corner and there are two arrows on this map. It says TNMN, True North, Magnetic North. The earth has a magnetic field that is drawing on the compass needle right here. Your compass needle will point towards that magnetic field of the earth. The thing is the magnetic field of the earth is not true north. It's offset by just a little bit. Worse than that, it moves. It moves about 50 kilometers a year. And so my map was printed right here, August 7th, 2020. True north, this way, magnetic north, five degrees west. West is best. So if I'm gonna use this to navigate, I need to add five degrees to my azimuth. So if I wanna shoot an azimuth of 124 degrees, in order to get where I'm going, I need to add five. That means I need to shoot an azimuth of 129 degrees. Now it's no big deal. If all I'm doing is going a couple hundred yards, you will never notice the difference between magnetic north and uh, true north. But if you're going a distance, right here at Snowshoe, I looked this up on the NOAA website, uh, National um, Aquatic, uh, Oceanic, whatever, administration. Look it up on NOAA. Snowshoe is nine degrees west magnetic declination that's what's called magnetic declination so if i want to if i want to travel i go 1.6 miles and i i don't compensate for true north i'll be a quarter mile off my target an entire quarter mile at 1.6 miles it doesn't take long you go 100 yards no big deal you go 200 yards no big deal you go a mile out there you go three miles out there you're over a half mile off target you're on the different mountain because you didn't compensate for where true north was. Not hard to figure out where I'm going with this message tonight. This is our true north. The word of God is our true north. Matter of fact, here's how Paul puts it. For 2 Timothy chapter 3, all scripture is breathed out by God, it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, training in righteousness that the man or the woman of God may be complete equipped for every good work now that's the, from the last letter that paul wrote that's in second timothy that's the letter the same letter that he said i have fought the good fight i have finished the race i have kept the faith paul knew when he wrote these words he knew he was about to die matter of fact christian tradition tells us 67 a.d roman emperor nero had paul beheaded with a sword lost his head over preaching the gospel so when he wrote this he knew he knew his life was on the line that this was the end of it he said, all scripture is breathed out by God. It is God inspired. We're going to talk about true north. But before we get to the true north and how this relates to our life, I want to answer just a couple of apologetic questions. Apologetics is why do we believe defending the faith? Defending that this, what I'm about to say is true. So let me answer three quick questions for you. Number one, did Paul know that when he wrote that all scripture is breathed out by God, did he know that he was writing scripture at that time? Because he's actually putting pen to paper and he's writing a letter to Timothy. Did he know that that was actually scripture? I mean, he didn't know it was the Bible because the word the Bible didn't come along until 1300 AD. That's a Latin word derived from a Greek word that didn't come along until about 400 AD, about 300 years after Paul wrote these words. And the Greek word simply means the book, real creative. But for the book, translated from Greek to Latin, you come up with the Bible. Did he know he was writing the Bible? Actually, yes, he did. Here's what he wrote in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. He says, we thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, from human beings, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as it actually is, the word of God. So Paul knew that as he was writing, that he was writing something very important, that it was the Holy Spirit inspired, and that what he was writing was going to be lasting through the ages. Peter acknowledged it too. He wrote, Paul wrote to you with the wisdom that God gave him. That's uh, 2 Peter 3.16. Matter of fact, all of our New Testament writers, Jude, James, John, Matthew, they all wrote under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Question number two, why these particular 66 books, this Bible right here, 66 books, 40 different authors, 1,500 years in the making, how do we know that these 66 books are the right 66 books? Don't the Catholics, don't they have like 73 different books? Go to the Council of Hippo in 393 AD, North Africa. There's a guy there named uh, Augustine. We call him St. Augustine. 
and uh, he headed up this council where they recognized the 27 books of the New Testament. They didn't, they didn't invent them. They didn't establish the, the books. They just recognized that these letters that have been in circulation for almost 400 years, they are the canon of Scripture. It was, uh, it was the mid-1500s before there was the Council of Trent that, uh, that the Catholic Church decided that they should add seven books to the Old Testament. Never been recognized by the Jews before. The Old Testament already had 40 books in it, and uh, already had 39 books in it, and they that, that was it. Matter of fact, the Old Testament is quoted over 100 different times by New Testament authors. Not once did they ever quote the Apocrypha, which is what the Catholics added to their Bible in the mid-1500s. So these 66 books, we are confident that these are... These are the Holy Spirit inspired books of the Bible. Aren't but aren't these just copies of copies? They were written. We don't have any of the originals, right? We don't have we don't we don't have the original writings of John. We just have a copy of a copy of a copy. Could be corrupted over the years, could have been embellished over the years, there could be copyright errors over the years. Well, here's how it worked out. In uh, 382 AD, the Greek manuscripts that we had were translated into Latin. It became known as the Latin Vulgate. In 1611, King James said, hey, translate the Latin Vulgate into English. And we came up with the King James Version of the Bible. 1947. Okay, now we're getting closer to like our grandparents' lifetime, right, at the, uh, right during World War II. The Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered over in Israel. The oldest fragment that we already had once we discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls, they were a thousand years older than the oldest uh, manuscripts we already had. And when the scholars got to looking at them, they laid up right nearly word for word. We definitely have exactly the thoughts that God communicated through fallen men, but Holy Spirit inspired the Word of God. So bonus question, is the Bible reliable? If it's reliable, is there any proof that the Bible would be reliable? So glad you asked. Second Peter, Peter again. Second Peter, verse chapter one, verses twenty and twenty-one. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. No prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. You see, God spoke to men; they wrote it down, and then prophecy. Here's the really cool thing: prophecy is writing something down that's going to happen. And then it happens. Like Isaiah wrote, Isaiah and Jeremiah, they prophesy that, hey, we're going to go into captivity. Jeremiah said, well, it'll be 70 years. Isaiah said, Cyrus will lead us out of, let us out of captivity. Cyrus hadn't even been born yet. It was 150 years before a guy named Cyrus was born. And then who let the Jews out of captivity? Cyrus. Over 300 prophecies predicted the life, the birth, the life, the ministry, the death, and the burial of Jesus Christ. There were two, only two, very obscure prophecies saying that he would rise from the dead. Psalm chapter 16, verse 10, you will not allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. Isaiah 53, 11, after the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life. 2,000 years later, we're like, oh yeah, right there, the resurrection right there. But if you were living in AD 33... You wouldn't have any idea what that was talking about. But the thing about the Bible is, it says what it means, and it means what it says. So, this is our true north. Now, what do we do with it? Well, we live by it, right? The problem is, is that culture and people are always pulling on the needle of the compass. And if we can get that needle off by just a degree, it can have catastrophic consequences down the road. So how do we align the true north of God's word? We're going to dig into it for just a few minutes here. Got some help turning the pages here. <laughs> you know, one degree off course, not enough to notice down the road. You can get a mile down the road, one degree off course, and you would look around and you would recognize landmarks that are on the map. And you would say, eh, it's not quite what I thought it was going to be, but yeah, I must be good. You get 60 miles down the road, one degree off course, you're an entire mile off course. And that, my friends, that's Satan's game right there. It's to see how much he can bend that needle without our noticing. 
So I'm going to take you to Matthew chapter 4. This is the temptation of Christ. Remember, Jesus was baptized. He's led out into the wilderness by the Spirit. There he goes 40 days, 40 nights with no food. And Matthew says he was very hungry. The most understated verse in all the Bible. He was very hungry. 40 days, no food. I'll bet he was. And Satan, the deceiver, the tempter, comes to Jesus. And he says, hey, you're supposed to be the Son of God. Turn these rocks into bread. Interestingly enough, did you know there's not an Old Testament law that says thou shalt not turn rocks into bread? It's not in the scripture anywhere. It's not a sin to turn rocks into bread. Jesus was hungry. But Jesus replied, and he quoted Deuteronomy. He says, man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And Satan says, oh, you like scripture, do you? Well, I've got a verse for you. Matter of fact, you want to be known as the son of God? I will take you to the top of the temple, to the pinnacle of the temple, and what you can do is you can jump, and everybody will know you're the Son of God because, Jesus, there's a prophecy about you. It was written in Psalm chapter 91. Let me read it for you, Jesus. It says, uh, it says He will command His angels concerning you. They will lift you up. You won't even strike your foot. So go ahead, launch yourself off. And Jesus Jesus replies, it's also written, do not test the Lord your God. And so then Satan goes to the direct approach. He says, just worship me. And, Satan, and Jesus says, get out of here, Satan. It's written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. But man, I'll tell you what, that sounded so good. When, Je when, when Satan quoted Psalm chapter 91, man, that sounded good. It's like he was here to prove that he was of God, that he was God, that he was a son of God. And uh, that was his whole purpose of ministry. And there is that passage in Psalm 91 that does say exactly what Satan quoted. So let's skim Psalm 91 real quick here. Psalm chapter 91 starts out this way. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Mm, that sounds solid. Chapter 4, he will or verse 4, he will cover you with his feathers. Under his wings you will find refuge. Man, when I was a kid... I heard a story about an old lady that got carjacked in New York City. And she had just read that verse in the morning. And so she's terrified. The guy jumps into the back seat, holds a gun to her, and says, Drive. And she starts quoting this verse, what she could remember of this verse. All of a sudden, the guy jumps, he bails out of the car, and he runs. The authorities catch up to him, they arrest him, they're interviewing him, and they're like, Why did you run? He's like, man, that lady was crazy. She kept saying, feathers, 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 freak me out. I had to get out of there. Now, <laughs> I have no idea if that story is true or not, but it sounds good, man. He'll cover you with his feathers. Yes, love it. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it won't come near you. And the chapter closes out. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him with long life. I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Now, through all of that, man, it sounds like God's really got my back. That last verse, with long life, I will satisfy him. I heard a preacher preach one time, said, man, God has promised us all a long life. And I'm not satisfied, so I'm going to live my whole life that God has allotted to me, and I'm claiming it. Interestingly enough, that guy lived to 86 years old. But what about my grandfather? Godly man, by all accounts, my mom's dad. Very godly man. He has left a legacy for my for my family, the Eagleston side of the family. I had a godly uh, grandfather on the Lee Master side of the family also who lived to 94 years old. But Grandpa Eagleston died at 41 years old in a car accident. Actually, tragically, he died on my mom's 20th birthday. She got a phone call from her mom. She's like, oh, it's going to be happy birthday. No, your dad's dead. Godly man. My cousin, 30 years old, newly married, serving the Lord. With everything that he had, leading in worship, helping with the youth, 30 years old, riding his BMW 1100, RS 1100, got hit head on by a drunk driver and killed instantly. Where's that long life? Did these guys, did they just not have enough faith? Or is the compass off by just, just a degree here? What's going on? Should be a warning to us that out of this very same passage, Jesus didn't claim that verse. His angels will gather you up and you won't even strike your foot on a rock. You know what happened to Jesus? He got spikes through his feet. So let's keep looking at this. 
the compass. Things pulling at the compass. You know what the number one thing that pulls at our compass? It's our own desires. And a culture seizes on our own desires. There's no doubt about it. 2 Timothy chapter 4. The time is coming when people will not endure, endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. And they'll turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Now, how does that happen? I can tell you this. It doesn't happen in an instant. It is so subtle. I'm not naming names today. I'm going to leave the judging to God. But I have been influenced. I've been influenced by teachers who get their compass off by just a degree. And here's how it, here's how it happened to me. And Paul warns us in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1 not to follow men. The church in Corinth, they were, they were fighting over, well, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, I follow Cephas, well, I follow Christ. And Paul, Paul he's like, you know, get off of this, of who you follow. We preach Christ and him crucified. And he ends his thought with, if you're going to boast, boast in the Lord. And so there is a huge danger in having a favorite preacher. Even if it's me, if I'm your favorite preacher, double check me right here. This is your true north. Just because somebody says it on a microphone, just because somebody says it on YouTube, this is your true north. So here's how it happened. Here's how it happened with me. I had a favorite preacher. It was early in my ministry doing GNCC. And um, I didn't really know what I was doing. Not that much has changed. Say it before you can. I'm still struggling trying to figure out how to do this. I know that I talk fast and uh, I, I know that I cover a lot of ground. And so early on in my preaching, I found a guy who talked really fast, covered a lot of ground, really dug deep on historical context, which I love. He was occasionally funny and people would laugh. I was like, that's a guy that I can emulate. And I listened to every message that he preached. And man, he was solid. It was so good. I, I even ripped off a couple of his messages and preached them here. I gave him credit, but I preached them here. Like I took notes and I was like, okay, I'm going to present it the way that he did. And I really liked this guy. Well, the compass needle, I don't even know if it got off by a degree, but it got bent just a little bit several years ago. And this is when the guy said, uh, we're not Christians because the Bible says so. We are Christians because of an event that happened 2,000 years ago. Now, factually, that's true. And I think I even repeated that line a little bit, that we're not Christians because this says so. We're Christians because Jesus died for our sins, was buried, and rose again. That's an actual event that really happened in 33 AD that we can stake our salvation on. And <laughs> I understood what this preacher was saying because he was like me. We both grew up as preacher's kids. We got thwacked in the head all the time. The Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says. Got tired of getting hit in the head with the Bible says. And realized, you know, people don't respond to that. Getting thwacked upside the head with the Bible says. And so this guy, he kind of went off. He this this uh, We're not Christians because the Bible says. We're Christians because of a historical event. That became his shtick. Old-timey word. S-C-H-T-I-C-K. His shtick. That was his thing. And he really started doubling down on, on this saying here. It felt a little weird that we're not given precedence to what uh, Paul said. This is God breathed. It's Holy Spirit. It's, it's profitable. It just it didn't quite feel right. Well, the next thing that happened was, well, you can't take Genesis literal. Genesis was written to a primitive people, never taking a hot shower in their life. How are you going to explain scientific, deep scientific things to people like that? So it's kind of broken down into terms that they can understand for where they are. Whether God did it in six literal days or evolution, it doesn't really matter because God did it. I'm like, well, now hold on a second here. That I'm really not comfortable with because God's not a liar. He's never lied. If he said he did it in six literal days, then he did it in six literal days. And I'm going to accept that by faith. That's what Hebrews says. That's how we know we're here. It's by faith we believe that God created everything that we see. So it was a little strange right then. Well, then, then came uh, the inevitable, we need to unhitch from the Old Testament. Don't really understand the grace of God and they all don't really see the grace of God in the Old Testament. We need to unhitch from the Old Testament. And at first I defended the guy because Galatians is all about we are not under the law. We're not under Old Testament. And so this was my guy. Man, I had really had a lot of admiration and respect for this guy. And so I'm defending him, but the whole time something's telling me that something, something is just a little, little bit off here. 
in 2019, we on GNCC, we did a series from the very first round to the very last round of Ironman, 13 races in a series. We did a 13 long series of through the ages and the pages from Genesis to Revelation in 13 rounds. I asked the pastor one, uh, before I did it, I was like, do you think you can preach the whole Bible in 13 messages? And I didn't even get an answer. I just got this look like, are you crazy or stupid or what? <laughs> And I said, well, I think we're going to do it. And we did. And you know what? It was revolutionary. It changed my life. Not because the preacher was so good, but because the background, the research that I had to do, what God had me studying, that was amazing. That, that high altitude flyover just helped me to zero in. What is this all about? And it's about relationship. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The sixth day, he created mankind in his own image. Male and female, he created them. Gave them a job to do, but they weren't alone in it. God brought the, the animals to Adam and said, Adam, you name them. I'll bring them to you. You name them. Everything's great. The relationship with their creator and with one another, that's how we're created. That upward relationship, that horizontal relationship. But you can't have love without free will. And you can't have free will without choice. So there was that choice. And Adam and Eve, they chose the same thing that you and I have chosen, the same thing that we would have chosen had we been back there. And sin entered the world, and it ruined that relationship. Not only does it ruin our relationship with our Creator, it ruins our relationship with one another. And the rest of this book is about restoring that relationship. It's a rescue mission of God to redeem His special pinnacle creation, you and me. And so God comes to uh to a guy named abraham he says abraham i'm going to do a thing through you and you've heard me say this many many times because the the abrahamic covenant is so central to understanding the whole of the scripture abraham i'm going to reveal myself to the world use you to do it you're going to be a father of a great nation lots of people lots of land blessing to the entire earth those three things and so as we go through the old testament we see how that promise is in jeopardy at every single turn if you read this, you'll read about Joseph being sold up into, sla into slavery up in Egypt. He's out of the picture. The, the family's only about 70 people big, and there's a famine. They're about to get absorbed in the Canaanite culture. And then they find out there's food in Egypt, and Joseph was up there and takes them to the land of Goshen where they multiply and they thrive. The whole thing, you come to the story of Samson. Everybody's doing what's right in their own eye. Nobody cares about the Abrahamic covenant. Nobody cares about a blessing of the whole earth. And God. You get to David, finally somebody that wants to step into that promise, and God. You get to the nation of Israel in the later days. They got Jeremiah and Isaiah and all these guys saying, hey, we're going to get sold off into captivity. Nobody cares but God. Holding true to his promise so that he could redeem his special creation through his son, Jesus Christ. And then you get to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. And you find out about Jesus, the Messiah. That third part of the promise that became flesh that came down to this earth to redeem and to restore and to, to allow us to come back into relationship with our Heavenly Father. We can't unhitch from the Old Testament. And so at the end of 2019, my antenna was fully up. I'm like, man, this guy, we're not going in a good direction here. 2020 came around and um, unfortunately... My favorite preacher started touting the line of, well, we have to love our neighbor. The very guy who preached such powerful messages of do not be afraid, do not fear. Jesus says, do not. I've heard such great messages. Now all of a sudden, oh, we gotta we gotta love our neighbor, which was not from God at all. Turned out to be not not it was a social, it was a social thing that uh, that was an enemy of all of civilization. People would fill the parking lots, big church, the guy who was a preacher of a big church, people would fill the parking lots. And they would see the live stream on their phone, but the doors remained locked. And I tuned out. I'm like, that's it. I'm done. I'm over. There's this, there's this passage in 1 Corinthians I need to pay attention to. No longer have a favorite guy. I tuned out. But now, here we are three years later, and this guy is gay affirming. Jesus is love. And we just got to love our neighbor. And the compass needle is spinning right now. So far, off course. But I, I have the true north right here. There are examples of other pastors and whole denominations that uh, they, that wander off into all kinds of crazy things. Uh, real quick, you know, the stick might be different, but if you hear a guy stuck on, hey, God wants you to prop, prosper, 
and they take verses out of context and they, they link them all together, man, you need to be aware of that. Um, health and wellness, you know, does God heal? Absolutely he heals. But we looked at this a couple weeks ago, three weeks ago. We looked at the life of Job. Job had an illness and he said it was from God. Well, we read the story, it was from Satan. But when Job said it's of God, God agreed with Job and said, yes, I did that. Why would God do that? Because he's sovereign. We concluded the message with Paul. Paul had an infirmity. Three times he prayed, take this away from me. And God said, my grace is sufficient for you. Why? Because God had a sovereign purpose. In both the life of Job and Paul, that sovereign purpose was humility. And you know what's key to have a relationship? Humility. God knows what he's doing. There's a mystical miracle movement sweeping the globe right now. It's, uh, it seems to say that God saved you so that you can do signs and wonders and healings and until the future. And it's to the point right now that there are even Christian tarot cards. What? How did we get here? Jesus warned us. Paul warned Actually, all the New Testament writers warned us that there would be false teachers and false teachings. And here we are. And it doesn't start out obvious. It's not Satan saying, hey, bow down to me. Instead, it's Satan saying, hey, here's a piece of scripture that says what you wanted to say. It's out of context, but we'll, never mind. It says what you wanted to say. Let's go with that. <laughs> there are things in the Bible that you and I might not like. But it's not because God doesn't like us. It's because he loves us. And if we follow it, it will absolutely draw us closer to him. I'll give you an example. If your brother offends you, go to him in private. I'd rather not do that. <laughs> I would rather talk about him behind his back. It's way more fun. <laughs> when you, oh, come on. I'm not the only one who's like that. It's way more fun, but what does it do? It breaks relationship. It breaks relationship with him. It breaks relationship with his creator, who is also my creator. It breaks all that relationship. So if I'll do it God's way, relationship is restored. Other things I don't like. You know, don't be drunk with wine. Safe sex for marriage, which is between a man and a woman. We might not like those things, but if we do those things, we agree with them. God works in us and through us. It's a guardrail. It protects our relationship. When we do life God's way, it protects our relationship, which is what this is all about. That's our true north, is our relationship with our creator, which is only, only available through his son, Jesus Christ. We're sinners, and we don't deserve it. We deserve judgment. We deserve hell. If we're honest about it, we deserve that eternal judgment that God talks about in his word. But God, in his great love for us, he sent his son to die in our place so that we could have right relationship with him both now and in the future. Jesus said he came to, that we may have life and we may have it abundantly. He also said that we can have eternal life. We can have life now and we have life for eternity. And so real quick, what about that Psalm 91 passage? We skimmed it real quick. Keep in mind, there's an eternity that awaits us. Jesus came that we'll have that abundant life and that eternal life, both. Now, I'll keep skimming some of the stuff that we skipped over. Verse 10, no evil will be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent. He will command his angels concerning you. He guard you in all your ways. On their hands they'll bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and on the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. And right there, that last word, Clues us in my salvation. What is salvation? Ultimate salvation. I don't have to pay the price for my own sin. Jesus paid that price for me. I am saved through the blood of Jesus who gives me eternal life and abundant life. There's a life then, there's a life now. As we continue to read through this, we read about eternal life. We read about new heaven, new earth. We also read about this thing called the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, the thousand years that he sets up his government on this earth. And specifics of that time on this earth is that the lion will lay down with the lamb and that children will be able to play with snakes and that he who dies at 100 years old will die a premature death. Oh, that sounds like Psalm 91. Huh. But... 
with the scripture as a whole, I can assure you that yes, the Christian can walk through fire, okay, through disease, can tread on lions and serpents, however long he lives and be satisfied with his life. And that that is a here and now thing. I know it because I have experienced it. You are going to see victories in your life as you put God first. And you have that relationship with him that's only available through his son, Jesus Christ. And you put you put him first in all that you do. You will see victories in your life. You will see miracles. And you, I believe you will see healings. I certainly have. I can testify to that. Last October, I met that tree at the, at the Buckwheat 100. And I got to have a nice little trip to the hospital. And with every passing mile, my lungs were filling with fluid. and It was getting harder and harder to breathe. So that by the time I got to the emergency room, I was no longer worried about my back being broken and the shooting, searing pain. I was worried that I can't breathe. And man, God's hand on me. I'm a walk and talk a miracle. I know that I am. And I know that God has answered prayers in all of our lives and that there are many more prayers to be answered. But the way that he wants to do it it's the way that he wants to do it. I'm going to submit to it because I want that relationship. And so I'm going to cling to my true north because I want that relationship. And as part of my true north, it's just reading it for myself, studying it inside and out. Get some help with it. I, don't, I, I go to all kinds of different commentaries all the time. And I pray over it and I watch YouTube videos. And I like watching different preachers. Don't, this, this is the true north. But learn how to read the compass. If you didn't learn how to read it, it wouldn't do a whole lot of good to just look at it. So yeah, there's some good. God has inspired a lot of people. And I know that he has given me even help in preparing this message. So listen to people, but always weigh it with this. If you don't read this every day, if you need a Bible, I got a stack of them over here. If we run out, I got more in the rig. It's God breathed because he loves us so much. Lord, thank you so much for today. We want to align our compass with you because we want the God things in our lives. Whatever that looks like, the good, the bad, the in-between, we want you to do your work in our life to mold us to be like your son, Jesus. We want to have that closeness with you. We want to be used by you for your eternal kingdom. And so, Lord, just challenge us, inspire us, protect us, go with us, and draw us to yourself. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thanks for hanging out. If you need something, come see me. And um, I guess we'll see you after summer break.